It's no secret that Amazon are not happy with the performance of Rings of Power. This $1 billion investment has not come close to paying off. Viewership for the show shrank with every episode. It has a 39% rating on Rotten Tomatoes and a truly pathetic 2.5 out of 10 on Metacritic. By the end of season one, even the shell media had no choice but to throw Amazon under the bus in order to save their own reputation. For example, The Guardian initially said that Rings of Power made House of Dragon look amateurish and eagerly joined with Amazon to R-bomb the fans during marketing. But after the laughably awful finale, they stabbed Amazon in the back and jumped the fuck off the burning Rings of Power bandwagon, admitting that the show was a quote, stinker. Rings of Power has also been a personal humiliation for Jeff Bezos, who wanted a Game of Thrones level success as a flagship show to lead Amazon Prime in the streaming wars. Instead, it has become an industry-wide laughingstock. Now, rumour has it that Amazon are well aware of the criticisms of the show and have sidelined the two idiots who created this disaster and are looking to replace them with more experienced, talented and competent showrunners. So this video is my official pitch to Amazon to make me, the despot, the new Rings of Power showrunner. So here is how I'm going to fix Rings of Power. The main problem with the show was that fuck all was happening in too many places. We had the village people story with the crappy romance between Stand in Legolas and Village Wench, the elves, Galadriel and Halbrand, the dwarves, the imitation hobbits, the Numenorians, and Adar and his orcs. Way too much shit going on, so straight away we're getting rid of the most boring stories, which were Numenor and the Imitation Hobbits. Starting with the Numenorians, they'll be in the show for five minutes. In episode one, we'll have the Blind Queen talking about how she will return when her army is resupplied and her people are ready, then she will go. And that's it. Done. We'll hear from them again in season three, maybe. But that, of course, leaves the problem of Isildur, who, as far as we're aware, is trapped somewhere in Mordor, but more on him later. Now, how do we deal with the sleep-inducing screen cancer that was the Harfoots? We'll get to them eventually, but not yet. Let the audience not miss them for a while first. Now Galadriel, so I don't think it would be an exaggeration to say that audiences have had enough Galadriel for now. Galadriel didn't manage to kill Sauron in the end, but she did kill an even worse, much more destructive and evil villain, Mary Sue. Audiences have clearly had enough of that millennial movie trope, and Galadriel was the asteroid that broke the camel's back. So Mary Sue Galadriel is gone. Now, obviously, this creative decision will be opposed by Jennifer Salke, the head of Amazon Studios. This woman cancelled an apparently awesome adaptation of Conan and fired the guys who were writing the Conan script because she felt the show promoted toxic masculinity. Those showrunners then went to HBO and made House of Dragon, which fucking crushed Jennifer's Rings of Power. So how do we avoid the gaze of Medusa? This is how we're gonna do it. While we're filming the real season two, we'll have a fake production set up, Argo style, to trick her into thinking that season two will be the same crock of woke shit that season one was. We'll have transgender elves, interspecies gay couples, we'll have fourth wall breaks in which pink haired female orc feminists look into the camera and say things like, so I guess you're wondering what a pink-haired feminist female orc is doing in Lord of the Rings. Well, you see, this show totally wasn't written by an old racist white guy, so there's that. And, uh, oh yeah, we hate bigotry. Huh, it's funny how that works. Anyway, uh, I've got to go destroy the whole elven patriarchy thing, so yeah, peace or whatever. We'll have long, boring conversations between the different races about how sexuality and pronouns work in their society. I use they and them as my pronouns, and when someone uses they and them as my pronouns, I feel like that person is listening to me, that person cares about me, and that person wants to have a conversation with me. And that I respect for my gender is really, really important. We'll have analogies meant to be a commentary on real world racism. So there'll be a kingdom bordering Middle Earth called the SUA that will be depicted as a morally backward, evil, racist, sexist, imperialist patriarchy. Galadriel will be introduced in season two in hot pursuit of a slobby looking male elf who fled Rivendell in order to avoid paying alimony to his ex-wife. The fugitive takes shelter in a fortress of men. Galadriel rides up, demanding the alimony fugitive's head. 
The men laugh at her from behind their walls and tell her to run off back to the kitchen, and in an instant she scales the walls in an epic display of her parkour mastery and castrates every man that gets in her way, finishing by capturing the fugitive elf, stripping him, roping him to her horse and pulling him through the shit-covered roads back to Rivendell. Just the kind of hero we need to see on screen, the kind of strong female lead that a modern audience can get behind. Yeah, we'll have all that bollocks that Hollywood types love. Medusa, or whatever the fuck her name is, she'll love it. And look, obviously I can't write both the real and the decoy script for season two, so if you do have some good ideas that you think will keep Medusa happy, please put them in the comments. In the real show, Galadriel will go through a character arc and become a leading character again in season three, but in season two, she will be demoted to a peripheral role. Though she will feature prominently in the season finale, she mostly mopes around Discount Rivendell having the odd conversation with Elle about the political events of Middle-earth and the elven response to it. We do need some exposition after all. And when she does talk about Sauron to her GBFF Elrond, we get the sense that maybe she's beginning to regret her decision to reject him. Let's be real here, people break up, they get back together, they get married, they're together forever. It happens, you know, it's, it's, it it's not, I don't totally believe once it's called a breakup because it's broken, you know, like I, but like, I just think sometimes people don't have the tools to express their needs and things like that. Yeah. And a lot of times it is totally over forever. But when you still have a lot of love for somebody. The problem is Sauron's no longer interested in Galadriel. He has been going through a character arc of his own. He's been binging clips of Andrew Tate, and now he's fully embracing the ultra-masculine Alpha Chad philosophy. If you think you're gonna find a man with options who's gonna genuinely, genuinely never ever consider those options ever, then he's just a low value dude. That's the reality of the game. The reality of the game is, if the guy has choices, he's going to consider those choices. Let's now tidy away a plot element that really shouldn't have been in season one at all. The relationship between Stand in Legolas and Village Wench. That relationship was pointless, boring, had no stakes, was not connected to the plot, and just ate up screen time. So this is what we're going to do in season two. Stand in basically just gets bored of her. Come on, let's be real here. He's been posted to that village for 78 years. This isn't his first wench, and he was always going to trade her in for a younger girl sooner or later. But we're done with the snail's pace plot, so we're going to do it sooner. Episode 1. We're in the new village. Basically a glorified refugee camp set up by the elves for the survivors from the Southlands. Here, Stand-In has of late been turning his gaze toward a potential new conquest. A 13-year-old girl named Lolita Lass. During a conversation with her, Stand-In discovers that her parents were killed during Adar's destruction of the Southlands, and now she's all alone. He immediately goes to Village Wench and tells her that he needs to take this young girl, Lolita Lass, on a journey to find her parents. Village Wench offers to accompany him, but he tells her, no, no, time is of the essence and all that, so thanks for everything, good luck and bye. He then takes Lolita Lass off on an adventure across Middle-earth, keeping her happy by spending money on her that he robbed from the refugee camp treasury just before he left. But of course, where's the tension? Where's the drama? No one wants to just watch some asshole thief off with his latest piece of forbidden fruit. So the whole time, there's hints that Standin and Lolita Lass are being followed by a dark presence, which will eventually cause Standin to go mad. A bonus to this subplot is that critics will love it. Just look at their reaction to cuties. This will increase our critic scores by at least 25%. Back to Rivendell, Gil-galad, the elven king, has been acting increasingly strange. He spends long periods of time in his inner chambers with a select group of pretty but increasingly desiccated looking elves. He gives commands that don't make any sense and has recently ordered a large collection of glass tobacco pipes made for him. He's beginning to look like real shit. He seemed pretty out of it in season one and had a greyish, unhealthy looking pallor but now he looks like one of the Oathbreakers from Return of the King. We soon discover that the man has become a full-on junkie and is now dependent on a mysterious ashy substance. Elrond takes a sample of the substance to Calabrimbor, his now full-on gay lover. A homosexual attraction between them was teased in Season 1, but we need to go all in on that in Season 2. This will be Amazon's March on Washington, Amazon's I Have a Dream speech, a statement of Amazon support for the LGBTQIA2 plus community, their rights. This statement will echo into future generations. 
but obviously we'll edit the gay stuff out of the show for reviewing in Muslim countries and China. That goes without saying. After examining the substance, Calabrimbor determines that it is a toxic mithril byproduct made from slag left over from the refining process and gives it the name methril. This confuses Elrond as he was under the impression that the Dwarf King had closed the Mithril Mine, which brings us on to the Dwarves. So as it transpires when Elrond visits Moria again, Deza has been secretly working the Mithril Mine to extract as much Mithril from it as she can, then exporting it all over Middle-earth. She has been using the profits of this operation to build a political faction inside Moria to overthrow the King. When Durin finds out, she flees to the safety of the Mithril faction, takes her and Durin's kids with her, declares her eldest son king, and herself queen regent, taking the royal title Queen Diesenberg I of Moria. This act takes Moria to the brink of civil war, but there are still too many undeclared dwarf guilds, and striking first would cause Deza to be viewed as the instigator of war, causing the neutral guilds to side with the king. So for now, she holds off and builds up her forces. Durin shows up to a negotiation to try to solve things diplomatically, but then all hell breaks loose between him and Deza, and they have an argument, and we're gonna include some of those fucking awesome Neo-Shakespearean lines that have come to define the Rings of Power dialogue. Where there is love, it is never truly dark. I would sooner kneecap a stallion than seek to imprison the mighty commander of the Northern Army. The sea is always right! The sea is always right! We can return in force and sweep the enemy from these lands like salt from a table. A dog may bark at the moon, but he cannot bring it down. But we're gonna do it far better. We're gonna have entire conversations of that shit. Why did you betray me, Deza? Even the weakest stone stands strong within a wall. Even the most beautiful of blades requires a sharpened edge. We are such stuff as hammers are forged upon, and even the strongest mountain is rounded with but little rock. Your father can no more lead this realm of Moria than can a heap of ash fire a sword. A dog may bark at the furnace, but he cannot summon its fires. Anyway, the meeting doesn't go well and Durin has to return to his father and convince him that the only way to avoid war is to build a strong political coalition now, before she gets too strong and makes her move. Because a lot of the dwarves are not happy with the king's refusal of the elven offer of two centuries of grain and other goodies in exchange for Mithril. That was a great deal. And you know, these people live under a fucking mountain. It's not like they're swimming in agricultural goods. So more dwarves are joining Deza by the day because they like Deza's policy of maximum mithril exploitation and because she's bribing them with money from the mithril operations. So Durin has to convince his father to put together a coherent set of political and economic policies that will keep Moria happy. But the king rambles on with the same bollocks he came out with in season one. Oh, we can't use the mithril. There are forces in this world too dark to comprehend, blah, blah, blah. So Durin grows increasingly frustrated. His mental state begins to deteriorate fast. His wife left him, took the kids with her. His father is a bumbling idiot of a leader. More guilds are declaring for Deza. Civil war is about to break out and nothing is being done to prevent it. During this extremely stressful period, Durin may just turn to certain substances to take the edge off. Can't really blame the man. During one of his substance-induced rages, he murders his own father after his father again refuses to act against Deza. Durin now declares himself king, but his act of patricide sends him completely over the edge of sanity. He descends into utter madness. But he is still functional and quickly declares all mines opened. He lowers taxes on extraction and refinement and makes a juicy deal with the elves through Elrond that includes military support and puts together a strong political coalition capable of military action. But in his private time, he has long conversations with his father's corpse, which he refuses to bury. He orders lifelike metal statues of his children constructed and eats dinner with them, and a stone statue of Deza, which he frequently argues with. It is at this stage that he becomes obsessed with the Ring of Power for himself. He gets started on the project, but before any real progress can be made, civil war has started. Deza's forces are on the move. She, very cleverly, has portrayed Durin's deal with Elrond as selling out to the elves, and, with a decent Casus Belli in hand, commences war. Now, let's get on to the Harfoots, and they're a big problem. They were the most boring element of a very boring show. Obviously, we can't have them just wandering aimlessly around for another season. I think the Harfoots have bored enough people to sleep, and we can actually do something with them now. So, 
The way I look at it, we use the Harfoots to introduce the new villain, and we need a new villain, because it can't be Sauron. Sauron's too likable. He'll be the half-villain. Think Loki, mostly out for himself, but also willing to lend a hand to the good guys when the price is right. But we're not going to do the whole morally ambiguous, cliched trope. You know, he could have been a good guy, but became a bad guy type villain. We want an utter son of a bitch, an irredeemably evil, sick, sinister, power-mad maniac of a villain. Now, I'm not going to lie. I have no idea who this villain is, but I say we just stick with the formula so far of opening up a Silmarillion character list, choosing the villain category, and picking a name. Because we all know no one on this project read the fucking book, and no one will. So fuck it, pick a name, and we'll use it for our character. Let's see, uh, Maglor. That's a cool name. Let's go with that. So Maglor has this fortress that he's built, and one day the Harfoots infest his lands and start pillaging his fruit grove. He shows up, his evil monster elf type creatures surround the Harfoots. Maglor's already decided what he's going to do with them, but he toys with them for a while just for fun. Hey, he's a harpist, isn't he? Okay, so he says if the Harfoots' strongest fighter can beat his weakest, they can leave. So he plays the harp and sings to the accompaniment of the utterly sad spectacle of a little Harfoot trying heroically to best one of Maglor's beasts. Obviously the Harfoot loses, but his attempt will earn this despised race of field vermin the sympathy of the viewers, and perhaps a few tears will be shed for them as they are marched off into Maglor's dungeons. Under torture, one of the Harfoots gives up Frodelma and Gandalf, and Maglor sends a squad after them. He realizes that if he can torture Gandalf into his own twisted monster wizard, it will be a valuable asset for him. The Harfoots will show up again, but not for a while. Gandalf and Frudelma are found and attacked by Maglor's squad. Gandalf manages to fend them off for a while, but it looks like all is just about lost when suddenly two of the Maglorians fall from arrow shots. A deus ex machina hero charges in from the trees, and it's standing. He has heard the fight while traveling with Lolita Lass and charged in to aid the set upon party. Gandalf and Standin manage to win the day for now, but a few Maglorians manage to retreat. Gandalf must get Frodelma to safety before more of Maglor's creatures come for her. He briefly thinks about asking Standin to take her, but Standin has these creepy, shifty eyes. He keeps looking around like he's worried someone is following him, and he just doesn't look right. He also seems in a hurry to get back to whatever he was doing before he came in to save the day. Gandalf also takes note of the fact that Standin has looted the bodies of the men he's just killed. So Gandalf thanks him and heads off. On the road, Gandalf and Frodelma meet a coachload of women heading south. The women say the new king of Mordor, Sauron, has decreed an open border and free welfare policy for all women of breeding age. Bear in mind, Gandalf has no idea who Sauron even is at this stage, so he thinks, yeah, sounds alright. It's better than wandering the roads until one of these Maglor creatures kills us. So he and Frodelma hop on the wagon and head south. Now we could do the video game movement sheet where we play music, show a map, and everyone arrives at Mordor after a few seconds in the same clothes and the same condition they were in when the music started playing. But instead, we'll let stuff happen elsewhere for a while. So stuff happens, probably in Rivendell, Elrond and Galadriel may be talking about the dwarves, then Maglor torturing hobbits, amusing himself with some local peasant girl he's captured, and some dwarf stuff, then back to Gandalf and Frodelma. After days of being pursued by Maglor's squad, which involved many of the migrants, I mean refugees, being killed, they make it to Mordor, where Sauron, still high on Andrew Tate videos, allows Frodelma and the other surviving girls in, but not Gandalf, saying he needs breeding age bitches, not useless old men who can't compete in the Darwinian mating game. The masculine imperative and the masculine perspective is you have to understand that life is war. It's a war for the female you want. It's a, comp it's a competition. Every chick's trying, every man's trying to get her. So Gandalf says a teary goodbye to Frodelma and takes off to Moria. He hears they're on the cusp of war and he's hoping to make a diplomatic intervention to prevent it. Sauron is walking with Frodelma and the other girls through Mordor and while explaining to them that a woman pursuing a career is a waste of time. A life without children is, is vapious and it's inane, and it's pointless. And you may sit here and think that your career matters, but the truth is that your job will fire you out women, don't give us a right. don't give us solitary right. shit. He is interrupted by Adar and a gang of Adar's Oryx. Adar says he is unhappy with the daily, mandatory three-hour gym sessions, the women-only immigration policy which keeps out fighting men in favor of dependents, the hustle culture grind set that is pushing everyone to the edge of burnout. The average millionaire wakes up at 4 a.m. 
Sauron's 200 women harem, and his constant flexing on social media, and Giga Chad orcs rounding up workout truants with encouraging slogans. Oh no, I promised to work out but I don't feel like it. I just want to play video games all day. Maybe if I make something up, he will leave me alone. You are going to the gym, right buddy? I know you're in there. How is that keto diet going? Adar insists that all Uruks should see themselves as equal and the society based on competition must make way for a society in which resources are redistributed from each according to his ability to each according to his need. There is some argument. It doesn't matter what system you construct. If you are a lazy loser, you're going to still be at the bottom of the totem pole because there's going to be people like me. I'm, I'm, I'm destroying you in capitalism, and I will promise you, as God is my witness, I will destroy you under communism just the exact fucking same. Because I'm smarter than you, and I work harder than you, and that's who I am as a man. I will always beat you. And things quickly turn bloody, and unarmored Sauron is pressed back at first, but a group of his orcs who are out on a nature walk dopamine detox see what's going on and rush in to help. Adar is mortally wounded and Sauron finishes the job by stomping on his face. Back to Gandalf now, it is on his way to Moria that Gandalf runs into a teenage girl, Lolita Lass, and a young man who we recognise as Isildur. He is the dark figure that has been shadowing Standin and Lolita Lass, and is now making his final getaway with the coveted prize. They share a brief exchange as Gandalf seeks directions from Isildur. Gandalf moves on and, in a market town not far from where he met Isildur, is forced to intervene to stop a crazed man who is running around the town square screaming at random townspeople. The stranger is, of course, Standin, and he is very upset and confused, almost like he's gone mad. He explains that he has been escorting a young girl to find her parents, but that she is missing, and this is not the first time she has gone missing. Gandalf mentions that he saw just such a young girl outside the town being escorted by a young man, and when an excited and extremely deranged looking stand-in demands to know in what direction they were heading, Gandalf, realizing this strange lunatic should not be anywhere near any young girl, makes the intelligent decision to lie and says they were heading in the direction of Moria. Stand-in attacks a random civilian outside the town, steals his money and horse and rides for Moria at top speed. So back to Queen Diesenberg, we next see her at a meet with Sauron. Here, Deza is revealed as the full-on villain, not the half-villain we've been hinting at so far, a full-on, power-hungry, ruthless villain. Here, Sauron and Diesenberg strike a deal. Sauron will support Deza in the Civil War and in exchange gets exclusive rights to the Mithril Mine to be exploited by his own miners. After the victory, he will make Deza a ring of power and open negotiations for a formal alliance between Mordor and Moria. Sauron tells Deza his army will be at the gates of Moria in five days. Just put Durin's forces under siege and when he arrives, they'll smash them with their combined force. On her way back to Moria, Diesenberg discovers that her forces have suffered a minor defeat in an ambush. She hurries into Moria, organizes her forces, and attacks the main hold of the Durin faction, only to discover that it's empty. It is at the moment when she enters her home and gazes in shocked horror at the statues of herself and her children that she is informed that her entire faction is besieged inside Moria itself. Durin's army has escaped through a secret tunnel and has blocked off all exits from the outside. Durin sends Deza a message, surrender or starve to death inside Moria. She plays for time, offering negotiation, knowing that Sauron is on the way and can break the siege. It's around this time that Gandalf arrives and offers his services to Durin as a peacemaker. Durin sends him into Moria to present his demands to Deza and bring her response, because why the fuck not? He has nothing to lose by doing so. At this stage, Maglor arrives outside Moria with a medium-sized army. He has heard that war has broken out in Moria and wants to get involved so that he can take a slice of the victor's cake when it's over, very much taking a page from the Mussolini playbook. Bear in mind, Maglor doesn't give a fuck who wins and would just as soon have sided with Deza if it looked like she was going to win. During Maglor and Durin's negotiation, we draw attention to a small but mysterious contingent of Maglor's army, a unit of small cloaked beasts. Maglor finds out about Gandalf and demands he be handed over. Durin agrees and they form a temporary alliance. 
In the event of victory, Maglor gets Gandalf and some Mithril, which he wants to use to experiment on the Harfoots, as well as, of course, an appropriately sized piece of victory pie. With the addition of Maglor's force, things are looking grim for Deza. The pressure is building inside Moria, and her soldiers want to know what the plan is. What are they going to do? One hot-headed young officer demands answers from her, and in a brave and stunning riposte to his toxic masculine behavior, Deza tells him to shut up, follow her orders, and get back to his post. No, I'm joking. She actually just tells him the plan. Sauron's forces are coming. Tell the men they should be ready to fight at very short notice. Because why the fuck wouldn't she tell him? That would be really stupid, and she's not a complete moron. Back to Standin, he's riding around the outskirts of Moria in a crazed search for Lolita Lass. He is riding a different horse now, presumably stolen after his last horse died from exhaustion. He's caked in mud and, for some reason, blood, though we don't know if this is his or someone else's blood. Clearly, he has entered the final nightmare phase of his dark journey. Back to Moria, Sauron's forces show up on the horizon, on time, as promised. We could subvert the audience's expectations by having him change his mind and decide not to bother with the attack on Durin, or by having him side with Durin. But nah, let's just have a massive battle instead. I think audiences would like that more than having their expectations subverted. So Sauron shows up on time, and it looks like Durin is well and truly fucked, caught between one army inside Moria and another outside it. Now Sauron doesn't wait around, he doesn't try to negotiate, he knows what he's here to do, and he charges in full fucking steam with his army. Battle is joined. Deza knows now is the time to strike and her army begins attacking the exits, suffering very heavy losses but gaining ground. Eventually they break out of an exit and as more and more of them pour into the battlefield, it seems all is lost for Durin's army, now being attacked on both their front and increasingly in their rear. But just then, word goes out that Durin's elf allies have arrived. The elves rush into the messy, disorganized, chaotic fray, and we now have a giant melee battle fought between two dwarf factions, Maglor's army, Sauron's army, and the elves. We will call this the Five Army Battle. The battle that Tolkien never wrote. Because, you know, he wanted to, but just wasn't as talented or creative as the Rings of Power showrunners. At a decisive moment in the battle, Maglor sends in his mysterious unit. The cloaked figures, they throw off their cloaks and we have our big reveal. It's the Harfoots. But now they're goblin Harfoots, a wretched, ruined, mad zombie-like version of their former selves. Maglor has used a combination of magic and torture to turn them into slave warrior beastlings. The goblin Harfoots charge into Sauron's forces, stabbing fanatically with short knives, biting, kicking and screaming. It is now that we see Frodelma in the battle. She is with Sauron's army as a result of Sauron's insistence that a unit of women be placed behind his army to shame any man who thinks of retreating. Frodelma comes face to face with Samiz, her one-time friend. Samiz is now a wretched, monster version of herself. She charges at Frodelma with murder in her eyes. They engage in battle. Meanwhile, Sauron is just having the fucking time of his life. He is living out the full-on battle chad fantasy he's been obsessing over for the past few months. Fuck where you fucking started, Weiji. <laughs> Someone has to fucking flip the burgers, dumbass. You're a man and you fucking die. That's the rules. That's the old school duty of masculinity. The battle between Frudelma and Goblin Samiz is going very badly for Frudelma, and just as Goblin Samiz is about to land the killer blow, Gandalf shows up, saves Frudelma, and kills Samiz, having been forced to fight his way to Frudelma in order to save her. The battle rages on awesomely for some time when all of a sudden a massive earth shattering roar freezes every combatant where they stand. They look over at the booming steps emanating from the cavernous halls of Moria and through its entrance bursts the Balrog. It screams toward the heavens and goes berserk. It kills everything it can get near. Elf, dwarf, orc, man, everything. Sauron sees the slaughter and in his blood drunk amped up state charges straight at the Balrog, but is luckily grabbed and held back by his men. After a short time, the Balrog has killed so many people and turned the battlefield into such a chaotic mess that no one knows if their own leaders are even still alive and so begin to retreat. But Gandalf, Maglor, Sauron, Elrond and Galadriel all team up in the end to take it on. To start, Maglor sends the Goblin Harfoots against it. These little kamikaze goblins are of course all killed, but surprisingly they succeed in wounding the Balrog slightly. 
The five warriors then work together to defeat the beast. And this is going to be a properly fucking epic battle that takes a while, alright? None of that Mary Sue shit from season one where Galadriel slaughters Robert Paulson in five seconds. His name is Robert Paulson. Alright, this is going to be the Fellowship versus the Cave Troll on steroids. But before anything can happen, Standing charges in on his exhausted horse like a bolt out of the blue sky. He is the very picture of a man deranged. He's filthy, he's clearly not slept in days, he's covered in blood and wears only a loincloth. He screams like a naked banshee, high on cocaine and buckfast, charging his horse straight at the Balrog, but is quickly unhorsed with a crack from the Balrog's whip before he can even reach it. But he fights with suicidal bravery. Badly wounded, he is encouraged by the others to leave the fight. Instead, he presses forward against the Balrog and is quickly slain. An ultimately futile attempt at moral redemption, for some sins cannot be redeemed. The man violated the innocence of an orphaned girl. He led her away from any chance of family and home, destroyed her future and permanently damaged her mental well-being and all for the gratification of his own sexual depravity. This will present an interesting subtext to the fight. We perceive the Balrog as the monster, but the Balrog is merely acting in accordance with its nature. Standin acted against nature. It is not the Balrog, but Standin who is the true monster. Goblin Hobo Baggins dies next when Maglor uses him as a human shield. This prevents Maglor from being outright killed, but he is very badly injured. Elrond, Galadriel and Gandalf form a kind of mini team to attack the demon creature and Sauron, who due to his excellent armour is most effective against the Balrog, takes it on lone wolf style. In the end, Sauron lands the killer blow, just as the Balrog is about to kill the already badly wounded Galadriel. Galadriel expected death, but instead she looks up to see this blood-soaked god of war towering before her, regal and magnificent in his armour and she goes mad with desire. She confesses her love, agrees to the marriage proposal from the previous season, and says she'll even move to Mordor, but Sauron is having none of it. With his victory over the Balrog, his alpha transformation is now fully complete. You know what I truly think a high value man is? Mm. Is a man who could say no to pussy. And I mean this on a genuine level. Here's yeah. the problem, yeah. here's the problem you girls don't understand. Galadriel returns to Discount Rivendell, a woman scorned, and begins to plot her revenge against Sauron and the world. She is no longer the pure-hearted warrior of yesteryear. She is now a vengeful alpha widow. Her battle injuries prevent her from ever fighting again, and in season 3 it will not be her sword but her cunning that she will wield with a brutal precision, striking against a world that has left her a rejected cripple. Maglor is so badly wounded that he's dying. Gandalf agrees to heal him if he releases the last of the non-goblin Harfoots. He agrees, so Fudelma, Gandalf and Maglor head off to Maglor's fortress. As it turns out, King Durin and Queen Diesenberg are both among the many, many warriors slain by the Balrog. Seven dwarf lords who survived the slaughter agree to give Sauron a significant quantity of mithril if he forges rings of power for them, takes his army back to Mordor and agrees to stay out of dwarven politics in the future. Sauron agrees and the dwarves get their rings. The elves call off their deal with the dwarves now that Durin is dead and take off. The dwarves are not happy about this and will seek revenge in season 3. Elrond finds his lover, Calabrimbor, dying among the ruin of the battlefield. They have a heartfelt moment and as his love dies, we see Elrond begin his descent, his transformation into the darker, world-weary and brutal warrior he will become. So now there's only one loose end we need to tie off. Gil-galad. So prior to the battle, he has one massive final mithril blowout, then insists on personally leading the army going to Moria. The Elven High Council go along with it, hoping he'll get killed in the battle, but frustratingly, he just won't die. He keeps fighting, keeps killing orcs and dwarves and whatever else gets in his way, despite his reckless mithril induced fighting. So in the midst of the melee, Elrond runs into him. Gil-galad is amped to the fucking gills and in a crazed monologue, declares his intentions for the elves with a neo-Shakespeareanism. The elves will war against this middle earth as a fire rages through a dry brush. Cleansing it of all the- But before he can finish, Elrond takes his head off. Elrond realises that this junkie of a field king will lead his people to ruin, and so does what needs to be done. Now this is a necessary part of Elrond's character development. When we were introduced to Elrond, he was behaving like this. By the end of the show, we need him doing this. So 
so he has got to get his hands dirty, and killing off Gil-Galad is a good move anyway, trims a bit of fat off the cast, and gets rid of a questionable casting decision. It also opens up a lot of political intrigue in the elven world, as they figure out how to try to replace their king. Obviously, Galadriel will be heavily involved in that. The main focus of Season 3 will be the world of men, since they need to get their rings, and that's when we bring Numenor back in. Sauron will forge the Ring of Power at the end of Season 3, leaving a cliffhanger, and will begin his conquest of Middle-earth in Season 4. This will climax with a battle for Middle-earth near the end of Season 5. So to recap, the following characters will die. Adar, Deza, Durin, most of the Harfoots, especially Hobo Baggins and Samiz, Gil-Galad, Calabrimbor, Standin Legolas, and the Balrog and Maglor and Galadriel will receive life-altering injuries. Maglor's injuries will be more severe and visible, making it easier for us to present him as a classical monster villain in Season 3. He will resent the fact that he was once beautiful, but is now a monstrous, battle-scarred wreck. Galadriel will be our half-villain, still beautiful and possessing of a goodness deep within, but resentful, jaded, increasingly power-hungry, and of course, pressed to wickedness by political reality. Elrond will continue to sink into a depressed rage, and Sauron will continue on his journey of alpha male personal development, even going so far as to make motivational videos and requiring all members of the Mordor military to watch them regularly. So that's my pitch. I will be emailing this to Amazon Studios and I'll let you know their response. Also, if you know Jeff Bezos' email address, I would appreciate it if you emailed him the video link. And let me know what your suggestions are. Obviously, this is just a script treatment. I haven't started work on the full script yet, so there is still time for changes before we start filming. Thanks for listening, subscribe, and don't forget that the like button is such stuff as dreams are made on.